In this video, we're going to talk about some ways to get good at using the TADs. Stig Reyes, Town 6, you're cleared to engage. Lead is a rolling in, engaging south to north, left in, right out. So I get a lot of questions and I see a lot of struggling with uh, how to use the TADs and how to use the linear motion compensator and there's a lot of uh, upset feelings that uh, the TADs doesn't lock onto things. Uh, just remember that, you know, the TADs is not designed particularly to be a, uh, a targeting pod like you're used to with fixed wing aircraft. Um, there is a function that you can lock onto targets. Uh, with the image auto track however that's not in the current build but I will tell you that even in real life we, we really didn't use the uh, IAT all that much um, I think that DCS players in general probably have a misunderstanding of how good uh, image auto tracking and point tracking is we use point tracking a lot in Kiowa's as well you know the thing about it is if you're point tracking something and it goes behind a tree you're gonna lose that point track uh, whereas I routinely see in DCS uh, vehicles going behind trees, going behind buildings, and the point tracks continuing uh, to, to track them. Uh, that's just not how it works because it's going off of a contrast, generally speaking. And uh, if that contrast is broken, then so is that lock. So uh, we don't really use the image auto tracker that much, but eventually it'll come on board. That'll make things a little bit easier. Uh, but first thing, let's just talk about scanning. So right now we are in FLIR and we're in the wide mode. And we can tell that we're in FLIR because it tells us up at the top left and plus the screen just looks kind of like it's in FLIR. And we'll go ahead and change the TV and we can see that we are in day TV, but we can already see that the zoom is different, right? So I'm going to go back to FLIR and we're looking at those trees and we're going back into day TV. And I am all the way uh, in wide view on the TV. Alright, so uh, we can already see that there's a difference between the FLIR and the day TV. I'm going to go in and to our uh, narrow and medium fields of view and you can see uh, how that looks on FLIR and then when I go to day TV we can see already that there's a, a dramatic change there all right last we're gonna go back into FLIR mode and I'm gonna go into all the way forward zoom there's that tree we can see how big it is and now I'm gonna go back into day TV we can see how much bigger that tree is so this is important to understand that while you're aiming particularly in daylight operations that, that day TV is going to give you a little bit more uh, fidelity on what you're looking at and it's going to help us when we're targeting things and we'll talk about that here in a few seconds so what do we need to do to find targets now the easiest solution when you're just trying to get kind of a, a lay of the land uh, is I'm going to be in wide field of view uh, either in TV or in FLIR uh, again wide field of view and TV can sometimes be a, a little bit hard to use uh, so I like to use FLIR as much as possible just to get that general idea of what I'm looking at so I can see that I've got a town out there and I've got a, uh, a little town over here on the road. And then I'm just trying to compare that with my TSD just to give me an idea of where things are on the map. Now I might have targets and waypoints already plugged in here to give me some, some reference, but what I'm trying to do is match what I'm seeing uh, on the TSD and now match it to what I'm seeing visually. Because once you get into the fight, it's kind of hard to go back and forth and try to make all these comparisons. Uh, so if you can kind of build that situational awareness early and figure out where things are, uh, that's going to make your life a little bit easier. And of course, if we go to the uh, attack phase on the TSD, I'm going to go ahead and arm the system. And if we laze, of course, we're going to get uh, adjustments to that TADS uh, uh, reticle there. Uh, based on uh, the manual range that it's set to at 3,000 meters, but then once we start lasing that range is going to extend so we can see that uh, it's updating there uh, where it is on the TSD. Uh, but we can also start dropping some targets. So we'll just laze. I'm going to hold down the laze and I'm going to hit the target store button, which is uh, located on the uh, left TDAC. On the uh, left TDAC handle there. And you can see that because we're in attack phase, it has dropped a target. Now I know some people are seeing waypoints drop. It's not supposed to do that. That's something that's going to get fixed in uh, future bugs. Uh, but you should be dropping targets regardless of what phase you're in. However, you won't see them until you're in the attack phase. And then of course you can see that information here on the chords page. And you can even set it as a acquisition point to slave to. Alright, so again we're going to just use that wide field of view as much as possible to just get ourselves oriented. But now that we're looking for targets, 
Of course, Fleer is going to help us in some regards because it is going to see hot spots. I'm just going to kind of zoom in and I can kind of see what I think are some hot spots out here. And then once I do that, I'm going to start zooming in. So you might be tempted to just go immediately to the full zoom and depending on the distance that may be okay or may not be okay. I'm going to go to full zoom and that works out for us here on Fleer, but we can see that we've got a uh, BTR out here in the distance. Uh, but we'll go back into the to, uh, wide field of view. But you can see you can barely see those little faint heat outlines out there. And that's what you're looking for when you're trying to do your scan. And if you're not seeing anything in the wide field of view, then go ahead and switch into to narrow or medium, whichever works for you. And again, start scanning and looking for those hot spots. We got something out here moving. And I'm just going to step in a little bit and see what it is. Okay, it's not enough. So I'm going to step in some more. Now I'm on full zoom. And I've got a moving target. Now this is where a lot of people are struggling. And we're going to talk about the linear motion compensator right now. A lot of you want to be able to just hit a magic button and have the TADs track that for you. I, I get it. It makes life a lot easier. And again, a lot of the targeting pods that you see on fighter aircraft uh, have that functionality and it works just a little too well. Like right there, we probably would have lost track of these cars if we were uh, on an image auto track or a point track of this vehicle because something is breaking that lock. Uh, you know, some, some aircraft, they'll have a little bit of a... Um, a little bit of leeway where the uh, the the uh, the sensor will continue to move and it'll try to reacquire and it may not reacquire that vehicle it may require that second one okay or may reacquire that third one there it just kind of depends uh, so I just don't want people to think that it's a magic button that's always going to work for you uh, but right now we don't have anything in the Apache so we've got to be able to either manually track it like I am or we're gonna have to learn how to use the linear motion compensator now this one's a little bit funky and what it does is it takes into account the movement of the aircraft, the TADs, and it takes into account the movement of the target. So I'm going to try to get on this guy. And I've turned on my linear motion compensator, and I'm not touching the control right now. It's moving on its own, and it's going based off of whatever tiny control inputs I've put into it before. I'm just making very minor corrections right now just to get it lined back up. I'm pushing up and down, up and down. And I'm getting it lined up, and now I'm not touching at all. My finger's completely off the system and it is tracking, but you can see this got a little bit too much forward motion. So I'm going to go to the left just a tad bit and slow it down. I'm going to go back to the right and I'm just trying to match that velocity. Now, what I think the problem that a lot of people are is like turning on the linear motion compensator and they're leaving it on. And then what happens is when we try to go to something else, like we're going to try to pick up this car is instead of making these very slight inputs, we try to make a big one and then we get a little bit lost and then we got a little bit more too much. We can't make these huge. When we get lost like this, the best thing we can do is turn off the linear motion compensator, go back to a manual, and then get roughly into that target area and just start gently moving the controls. And again, we're looking at something pretty far away. I zoom in as much as I can. There we go. So if you're trying to use this with uh, just buttons, it's going to be very difficult. You need to have something that can kind of measure the magnitude. So I'm using the little mini stick on the front of my uh, Verbal Mongoose. And you can see that we've got a pretty good track. I just kind of messed that one up a little bit. But we got a pretty good track of this vehicle. Uh, you know, we probably wouldn't be shooting a Hellfire at a guy driving at 50 miles an hour anyway. So really at this point, we're just kind of tracking. And I'll tell you what I used to do in real life when I first started flying Apaches and was trying to get used to the system is I would fly with guys and ask them, hey, can I sit in the front seat and can you just hover somewhere and just let me play with the TADs? And, you know, with hold modes, they didn't care. They would just sit there and eat a sandwich and leave the aircraft at a hold. And uh, and I would just track cars uh, as much as I could and just try to get used to the system. But you can see that with a light touch, you can make those corrections and you can start changing things. The hard part, of course, is if the vehicle is trying to evade, uh, which, you know, he probably is going to at some point. Uh, but just get used to making those fine uh, motor corrections on the controls and you'll be able to get that linear motion compensator working for you. Now I'm going to go back to a wide field of view and you can see it's still moving and you can see that we are still on track. So as long as that vehicle doesn't change its rate of movement or its uh, direction, uh, the TADS is going to continue to move at that same rate. Now here's where the problem is going to get into. If I start trying to make those corrections now, to look at something else and I've got the linear motion compensator on it's not gonna let me make fine tune adjustments so again I've got to turn it off let it stabilize itself move it into where I want to look and then zoom back in if you leave it on and you zoom in and now you try to move to look at something you're gonna be chasing it all the live long day so don't do that just turn it off let it stabilize 
and let it set onto the target. Now we're going to practice that again. I'm going to have George move around for me to make it a little bit more challenging. And uh, we'll get back to you in a second. All right, so we got George on the go now. He's going to accelerate to uh, 70 knots for us. And we're just going to continue to kind of play with the linear motion compensator. So I'm zoomed in on the target, but you can see I'm having to make these constant corrections to keep my sight on the target. And that's where, again, the linear motion compensator can be our friend. We've got it in the uh, target area. I'm going to turn it on, and I'm going to make those minute corrections. Now you can see and we're moving at 60 knots increasing. We're at three and a half Ks. And we're able to maintain a, a pretty solid track on this guy. Enough that if we needed to, we could turn inbound and shoot. So let's go ahead and have him turn. And we're not gonna shoot. I'm not really set up for it. But you can see, I don't even have my hands on the controls right now. And I'm keeping that crosshair right on the target. I'm gonna have him turn a hard right. Still don't even have my hand on the controls right now and we're pretty much keeping a track. And let's say I've hit that target and now I want to move to another. I need to turn off that linear motion compensator and start finding my other target. And there he is. Turn on the LMC, just make light corrections. And now I've got it on target right where I want him. All right, the last thing I want to talk about is actually how we should be aiming at targets. Uh, there's one thing that we need to understand is laser energy and the missile, uh, in the case of the Hellfire, you know, it's going up. Now, I don't know how much of this is modeled in DCS, so we're just going to talk about it conceptually. But we know that the front slope of this vehicle, uh, you know, it kind of it kind of goes underneath. If I were to uh, shoot the laser right here under the bumper, right, or the bottom of the target, then potentially the missile will go over and not be able to see that laser spot. Uh, so real world, we really want to laser to a point where we know the laser is actually going to be detected by the missile. Now, how much that is modeled in the DCI is probably none of it. Uh, but one thing I have noticed is guys that aim a little bit too high on the vehicle, uh, the laser spot might actually go through the vehicle because of the way that it's rendered or, you know, whatever computer magic that goes on that I don't understand. And so the laser spot is actually past the target. So what I'm typically trying to do is aim here at the wheel well type area, the lower portion of the body, the lower uh, one half, I'd say, of the target. And that's where I want to aim, and I'm generally hitting exactly where I want to hit. Now, the other thing I want to point out is, uh, I guess you could <laughs> call it targeting etiquette. So what is the best way to aim at stuff? All right, so I had a boss who used to say, you know, you aim small, miss small. So instead of staying in FLIR, obviously it's daytime, so we can do this. We're going to go to day TV. We can see how much bigger the target is for us. So it's a lot easier uh to maintain our spot on the target because remember based on our zoom level uh the tads is gonna it, it's gonna respond accordingly so if i go into i'm all the way out into wide field of view and i just do a quick sharp movement to the left or right you can see how much displacement there is now i'm going to zoom in on the target and i'm going to make those same corrections it's the exact same movement on the thumb force controller and you can see that i'm barely moving off of the target okay i'm actually holding it down longer than i was in the uh, wide field of view okay so by having it zoomed in as much you're giving yourself much more control over that laser spot and you are able to maintain the track exactly where you want it now obviously we're pretty close so the target looks really close uh, but even at further ranges you want to get zoomed in as much as possible so if you can uh, transition to day tv from FLIR I highly recommend it of course one other thing I can harp on and I'm as guilty of it as the next guy is always trying to laze and store your targets as much as you can. Uh, that way you can reference back to them through your acquisition and slave modes if you uh, have to pull off of the target or if you're uh, developing the situation and you're just trying to store targets and, and prepare yourself for an eventual attack. Uh, go ahead and laze and store those targets. Now, if you've got a ton of targets out there, uh, you may not want to laze and store every single one of them. Let's say we have a group of four here. You know, what I might do is, is laze and store uh, and call this group one. And then if I had another group, I'd put a, a laser spot and store on group two and, and just pass information that way. Uh, but if you are trying to uh, you know, give exact grids to multiple targets, then yeah, you'd want to go ahead and laser and store each of these because you're going to get those grids uh, to be able to pass on to someone else. 
All right, guys, I hope this video was helpful and it kind of shed some light on how to work with that linear motion compensator. Uh, but like I pointed out, you know, real world, I trained for hours, literally just hours of hovering and uh, getting, you know, relatively good at how to use the system. Uh, if you're jumping into this module and thinking that you should be able to push a button and everything works for you, uh, you're, you're probably going to be disappointed. You need to spend some time uh, just going out here using the civilian traffic and tracking those targets and, and just understanding how the system is going to work. Uh, start making the aircraft move, figure out how to track moving targets that way, and then uh, just work on uh, how you transition from one target to the next. All right, guys, we'll talk to you later. Have a great one.